We're making our way through the book of 1 Peter, so if you have your Bible, please turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. Words like attaboy, girl," or way to go are always encouraging no matter who they come from. But they can be even more encouraging and soul-stirring when they come from someone special. If one of your friends says, way to go, that's cool. But if your dad says it, that's even better. If a teammate says, man, that was awesome, that's cool. But if a coach that you look up to says, man, you did a great job, that's all the better. Maddie, our seventh grader, where is she? Oh, she's teaching class this morning. She had Coach Calhoun for seventh grade basketball. She's seventh grader, Coach Calhoun earlier in the year for basketball, and he ended up being her favorite coach. If Coach Hopefully this won't go out. But if Coach Bradshaw or Coach Brooks said to Maddie, had a girl, she liked that. It matters. But if Coach Calhoun said it, man, she was flying high. She loves Coach Calhoun. In fact, if you ask her now, and I would have never believed this, Maddie, what's your favorite sport? Like she played all five this year, volleyball, basketball, track, soccer, tennis. She played them all. And uh, if you ask her to rank those five, I would have bet a lot of money that volleyball would have been far and away number one as she's looking forward to next year. But it's not. It's basketball. And I said, is that because you love basketball or is it because of Coach Calhoun? Coach Calhoun. And he won't even be the coach next year. He'll still be with seventh grade. She's begging him to move up to eighth grade, though. But he can't make that decision Obviously, we're going to see, among a lot of other things, a prospect of a powerful at a boy, at a girl this morning. Ms. Shanti read the passage to us. We begin in verse 3, and here's this first point I think that our salvation through Jesus Christ promises a glorious and sure hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. There's the word. We have, as Christians, hope. And biblical hope is not something that is up in the air, right? Like, I wonder what the weather's going to be like today. I hope it doesn't rain. It's already rained. But I hope it doesn't rain. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. I'm not real sure. That's not what biblical hope is. Biblical hope is assured expectation based upon what God has promised. Peter says we have a living hope. It could be the idea of living, that, it, that it's growing. It's a growing hope that increases year by year. It could be that it carries this idea of that it's genuine rather than not dead and unable to deliver. It could be the idea that it's influential, meaning that it's a hope that we have that's alive and it influences the life that we live day by day in light of the promise for tomorrow. It may be that Peter describes it as living because it's connected to the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We have a hope, and this hope is sure because Jesus Christ who died, who suffered and died and rose again, promises the same to us. We may suffer. We will certainly die. But through him, we will most assuredly be raised from the dead. 
One said, pastorally, this future orientation is important for our author. For a suffering people who may see only more pain and deprivation ahead, need to be able to pierce the, cl- the dark clouds and fasten on a vision of hope if they are to stay on track. Peter is consumed in many ways with this idea of hope. We, we just read about it there in verse 3. Over in verse 13, therefore prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you. In verse 21, that through Jesus we are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that our faith and hope are in God. In chapter 3, verse 5, for in this way in former times the holy women also who hoped in God. And in 3.15, this famous verse, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you. We have, through Jesus Christ, a living hope. And we have it because of his great mercy. God taking pity upon sinners like you and me who did not deserve his blessing. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But praise God that he acted, we already sang and looked at, he acted in grace to give us what we don't deserve. And he acts in mercy towards us to withhold what we do deserve. In God's great mercy, we've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And this hope is glorious. In verse four, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Word after word after word that Peter uses to describe the life to come. It's imperishable. It's not subject to decay. It's unable to be worn out with the passage of time. Another Maddie illustration this week, she sent me a text out of nowhere. I want your Bible when you die. I didn't respond. A moment later, I'm calling it. A moment later, put it in your will. (laughs) Finally, write it down. Thinking, does she know something I don't know? (laughs) I'm not so sure she wants my Bible. Those come and go, but, but, but I think she has in mind my cover. My brother made this for me in 1993, and, and I love it. And I told her, okay, Maddie, you, you, get, you get the cover. Um, but it, my brother built it, made it. The, the thread is coming out. The dog has gotten after it. It is perishable. She will inherit it from me, but it won't last forever. Our inheritance will. It's imperishable. It's also undefiled. It's unpolluted by sin, containing nothing unworthy of God. It will be absolutely pure and perfect, and it will not fade away. It'll never wither, it'll never grow dim, it'll never lose its power or its glory. Peter will quote in chapter, later in chapter one, all flesh is like grass, all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And here, our future inheritance will not fade away. I'm not so sure we're meant to take each one of these words and parse them too much. It could be that Peter is 
writing with a little bit of rhetorical flair here. And don't be impressed. This is my Greek New Testament. I can pronounce the words, but that doesn't mean I can translate it. All right. Used to be better at that, but I've let it go over the years. But listen to what he says here. The, here. Here's the words, imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away. Aftharton, kai amianton, kai hamaranton. They all start with that aha, and they all end with the ton. And, and so it's, it's these repetitive alliteration, almost rhyming words that Peter is stacking upon each other to tell us of the eternal character of this inheritance and in my word the glorious nature of the sure hope that we have again or really to add to it it is sure we have a hope it's glorious and it's sure it's imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This inheritance is reserved in heaven. It'll never be denied his people. He's keeping watch over it. One said, while the Christian adversaries might destroy all they have in this world, there is a reward that no force on earth can touch. This inheritance should give them hope in the darkest times. But, but not only is the inheritance safe, so are we. It's reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God. It's not much good to protect an inheritance if the heir is not going to be around to receive it. And therefore, God not only protects this incredible inheritance, but he protects his people as well. One of the guys I read this week noted that this, this word, who are protected, it's, it, it can be used in, in two different ways. One, it, it could be used of a guard who is watching over a prisoner before the verdict. And so this is a prisoner who may want to run away, but that guard is there to protect them from, or guard them from running away. Another way the word is used, though, is it is of like a soldier who is protecting someone through hostile territory until they get to the freedom of the front line. That's probably the idea here. That God through his power is protecting us as we navigate hostile territory all the way until this salvation is revealed and we receive this glorious inheritance that is to come. He will protect us, keeping us from anything that would separate us from him and this coming inheritance. So our salvation through Jesus Christ promises a glorious and a sure hope. Secondly, it also provides joy in the midst of suffering and waiting. So we see our word joy in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. And then down there in verse 8, you greatly rejoice with joy, inexpressible and full of glory. Just note, Peter is not calling upon us to be joyful. He's just describing what is true of Christians. These Christians, when they think about their future salvation, rejoice with an authentic spiritual joy. And it's not a continual feeling of hilarity 
or a denial of the reality of pain and suffering, but it is the anticipatory joy of what God has promised. This imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away inheritance that we will enjoy forever and forever. Despite the outward experiences that we might have right now. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. We said it last week, we'll say it almost every week. This book is about present suffering, future glory. In just a bit, he will talk about the sufferings of Christ and the glory to follow. And just as Christ came and he suffered, but then he was resurrected and exalted, so too it is the hope of the Christian that you and I as followers of Jesus Christ, for now, for a little while, if necessary, may suffer. But... There is glory to come. And so it is good for us to see that these are for just a little while. Our sufferings, they are temporary. The psalmist said, weeping may last for the night, but a shout for joy comes in the morning. If you want to glance at chapter 4 in 1 Peter in chapter 4, verse 7, Peter says, The end of all things is near. And in chapter 5, in verse 10, After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. And these trials are various. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed or you have been made sorrowful by various trials. Some of the trials we bring into our, own, our life are of our own making. Can I hear an amen? Amen. It's called folly in the book of Proverbs. When we play the fool... When we go our own way rather than God's way, we often bring unnecessary pain into our lives. That's one way we can experience trials. Another way is just the mysterious will of God. It's not a result of our own foolishness. It's not a result of persecution. It's just a result of God in his mysterious will bringing hardship into our life. Sickness, an accident, a strained relationship with a sibling or with a child or with a friend, financial hardships. And then, of course, the third is persecution. Because of faithfulness to Jesus, the unbelieving world, in measure, putting pressure mocking, ostracizing, slandering, maligning, and obviously can be worse. Those are the various trials, and in the midst of it still, God's people greatly rejoice. Maybe it's because they know that there is a purpose to these trials in verse 7. So that the proof of your faith, the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire. So, right, you take gold and it's wonderful, but you submit it to the fire and the impurities burn and you can take those off and it gets, it gets purer and purer. And seemingly that's what God does with us through trials and ultimately seeks to prove the genuineness of our faith. We 
Remember Satan in Job chapter 1? Essentially, it was, God, the only reason Job is faithful to you is because you're so good to him. Life is so easy for him. If I can heat it up a little bit and make it stronger, you'll see he'll deny you. And of course, God gives Satan permission to bring hardship and tragedy into Job's life. And Job learns and he trusts God. And he comes through that fire stronger and with a proven faith. That he wasn't faithful to God simply because things were good. He trusted God and he remained committed to him even in the deepest of sorrows. Trials should not surprise us or cause us to doubt God's faithfulness. Rather, we should actually be glad for them. God sends trials to strengthen our trust in him so that our faith will not fail. Our trials keep us trusting. They burn away our self-confidence, drive us to our Savior, and in the end, confirm that indeed our faith is solid. And look at the result. The proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter keeps looking towards this future day. He'd already mentioned it there in verse 5, a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. He's talking about the second coming of Jesus, the revelation of Jesus. And at the revelation of Jesus, there's going to be praise and glory and honor. And for the longest time, I read that phrase referring to, yes, when Jesus comes, we're going to give him praise and glory and honor for who he is and what he has done and how he has worked in our lives and through our trials to confirm our faith, praise and glory and honor to him. And it may well be that, but there are many interpreters who think in the context, do you know what this is? This is praise and glory and honor for you. Add a boy, add a girl. When you go through a hard time and when you trust God through it and when we see it and we come alongside you and we say, way to go. I know you've been through a hard time and I know you were in the depths and I'm sure Satan tempted you to give up but you didn't. You kept trusting, you kept clinging to Christ, even in the midst of your hardship, way to go. That probably feels good. But can you imagine on that day when Jesus is revealed, certainly we will give him praise and glory and honor, but he's gonna give us praise and glory and honor This is probably Peter's way of reflecting on Matthew chapter 25. Well done, good and faithful servant. Paul in Romans 2 talks about our praise is not from men, but from God. Or in 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, each man's praise will come to him from God. We're going to receive the add a boy, the add a girl from Christ our Lord. That's an amazing prospect. So we rejoice. We greatly rejoice, even in the midst of our trials. And let me just say this is kind of an aside this is why we sing on Sunday mornings. 
And this is why you can go anywhere in the world as the sun is doing its thing and moving, and you can go anywhere in the world and you can find a group of believers who are gathering together as the body of Christ no matter where you go in the world, and they are singing. Christianity is a singing religion. It's a blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ religion. Why? Because we know that we deserve his wrath, but God in grace and mercy and love and kindness has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead for an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God. And in this we greatly rejoice even though now, if necessary, we have been distressed by various trials, knowing that the testing of our faith, well, now I'm going into Romans. Anyway, you get the picture. Guess who doesn't sing? Muslims don't sing. It's not a singing religion. Our God is a God of love and mercy and kindness and grace. He's Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. And before he created the world, before time was, he has been a God of love within the Trinity, Father loving the Son, Son loving the Father in the Spirit. And thus when he creates, he does so not because he is needy and not because it, it is primarily an act of power. He does it to share his love. Islam does not believe in a triune God. They believe in one. He is one person. And one person can't love anybody. And so before creation... There was nobody for him to love. And so he creates as an act not of love, but an act of power primarily. And he's not a God who is love. And so we sing, we rejoice when we come together. Because our God is great. Again, anywhere you and I go, all over the world. High churches, low churches, in between churches. If they proclaim the grace of God in Jesus Christ, they're singing. I hope you sing. I thought this this morning. This is a terrible thought. What if, never had this thought, what if when we get to heaven, we know we're going to sing, right? So what if those of us who sing now, when we get to glory, our voice only gets better? But what if those who don't sing now, your voice doesn't get any better? And you're going to sing, and we're all going to hear you. But your voice doesn't get any better. That's a terrible thought, isn't it? It's nowhere in the Bible. So <laughs> sing. Even in the midst of our trials, we rejoice. And in the midst of our waiting. That little word there in verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while. There's, there's something better coming. But we got to wait for it. And in verse 8, and though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but, but believe in him. Remember, Peter is writing to Christians scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. They are in modern day Turkey. And they, unlike Peter, had never seen Jesus. Peter had been with him for three years, right? And Peter had seen him resurrected from the dead. But these folks are just like you and me. They had never laid eyes upon Christ. 
But through the proclamation of the word, God had brought them to life in Christ and they love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him. So there's that that word now again. Now we don't see him. Now is a time of suffering. But there's a day of revelation coming. He's going to come again. And so we greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of our faith the salvation of our souls. We love Christ. We, we believe in Christ. Some think maybe the idea is that, that we're committed to him, even though we don't see him. In this time of waiting, we still rejoice in him. So our salvation brings us, provides for us a glorious and sure hope And it provides for us joy even in the midst of our sufferings and our waiting. And then finally, it proclaims a privileged experience that even the prophets and the angels don't know. That's pretty neat. As to the verse 10, as to this salvation, this this salvation that we enjoy now but will come in its fullness at the coming of Christ. The prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. I love it. When, when Peter is, is wrapping up what he just said in a word, he calls it grace. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So these Old Testament prophets, as the spirit of Christ within them was guiding them along in their prophetic ministry, so much of what they did was cry out to the nation of Israel to repent and come back to obedience to God. But some of what they did as well was to look forward to a day when Messiah would come and usher in the new day. And according to Peter, they didn't, they didn't get it all. And they wondered about it. They meditated upon it. When will this be? And, and what will it look like? It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. We experience what they were trying to figure out. This group of believers that Peter was writing to and you and I, we experience the grace of God through Jesus Christ with a greater understanding of the Messiah and his work to suffer for his people, to be raised again, exalted to the right hand of the Father and one day to come and bring it about in fullness. They were pondering it. They were meditating upon it. They couldn't get it. But in Jesus Christ, now we experience it. And not only the prophets, it was revealed to them that they were not serving serving themselves, but you in these things, which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Others translate it, things in which the angels hope to catch a glimpse. That's pretty cool. Jesus Christ came into the world as a man to save humanity, those who believe in Christ. He did not come as an angel to save the angelic realm. And even the good angels in heaven apparently ponder at the amazing grace of God that's come to believers like you 
and me. One commentator says, Peter stresses that far from being underprivileged, Christians have received special favor from God. The prophets spoke indeed of grace, of salvation, but the deliverance prophesied did not belong to them, but to the Christians reading this letter. However much these readers may be suffering, they stand in a position that even the greatest of the ancient prophets did not have. Another, the remark underlies how fortunate are those living to see and experience personally the fulfillment of the prophecies. In summary then, Peter points out that the Holy Spirit has revealed that the readers are now living in the time when the prophecies of salvation have been fulfilled. This confirms their Christian experience and gives a firm foundation for their future hope. He provides a rationale for the relevance of the prophetic writings to these Christian situation and thus emphasizes their privileged position. Brothers and sisters, we live in this period of present suffering. The glories are to follow at the revelation of Christ. So until then, let's remind ourselves of the things Peter is reminding us. He's not asking us to do anything. So maybe he just simply wants us to remember. We have a glorious and sure hope because of God through his son, Jesus Christ. And we rejoice even in the midst of our suffering and our waiting because of what God has done through Jesus Christ. And we are privileged to experience the fulfillment of what the prophets looked for and what the angels, if you will, scratch their head at. All because of God through his son, Jesus Christ. So let's remember and let's stay true and let's keep going. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you have done for us through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we who believe, help us remember these sorts of things and steady ourselves with them, strengthen our souls with them. And we pray, if there's any here today that do not have this hope, this glorious and sure hope to be revealed at the coming of Jesus Christ, to be inherited, imperishable, undefiled, won't fade away. If they're here today and, and they don't have that assured expectation, they're not sure if it's theirs. Maybe they haven't been able to rejoice even in the midst of their suffering. Maybe they go, I, I know nothing of what you're talking about, this grace that has come. Oh God, might you open their eyes right now, the eyes of their heart, to see Christianity. It is the grace of God, the mercy of God, to send the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from our sins and reconcile us to God and give us the sure promises of eternal life. Help them to see it is Christ and it is not them. It's not their good deeds. It's not their moral resume that will somehow impress you. Help them to see they have sinned and their only hope is the grace and mercy of God through Jesus Christ. And they would now, right this moment, turn to him, 
trust in him, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and they will be saved. We'll pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen.